Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody again. And, uh, well, our coffee cups are with you, so evidently you've had a break. And for those of you on television, if you ever come to Tulsa and can be a part of our taping, uh, that's the way we do it. Tape a half an hour program, we take a coffee break and come back for another half hour, coffee break, and we do that through four programs. So if you're ever in the area, we'd love to have you come in and join us. We got folks from Indiana today, so uh, good to have Jim and Rita with us again. They've been here several times, but uh, we always like to see folks come in and spend the afternoon with us. All right, we're not going to make much ado about announcements, except Iris does like to always have you understand that if you want something about today's program, we are in book 50. And uh, we're in the final program of book number 50. So give us about a month, and it'll be ready to come from the printer. Always remember, it takes at least a month after we've given the last program before it's ready to uh, send out. All right, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. I wish I could have had a couple, three more minutes on that last one, but uh, we'll move on. <clears throat> that after we see the association of the Old Testament economy as it was practiced back there, first in the tabernacle, later on in the temple, which of course had the same floor plan, but we're really referring to the tent in the wilderness here in Hebrews. And then our last verse was that all these things, the furnishings, the Day of Atonement, the bringing in of the animal's blood, all of that was just a picture of what would be fulfilled and consummated when Christ would go the way of the cross. All right, so now then the first word of verse 11 is what? But. Flip side. Yes, all that was as good as it could be, but it had now outworn its usefulness. Now we've got something, as we've been seeing all through the book of Hebrews, something far better. But Christ, after the priesthood of Melchizedek, Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, now I'm reading this slowly, not made with hands. Well, if it's not made with hands, where is it? In heaven, in the heavenlies. There is a prototype, and we showed that several weeks ago, that when Moses got instruction to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, what was it patterned after? the likeness in heaven. All right, and here it is again, that this priest, Christ, the priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with silver and gold and animal skins and linens and so forth, but with materials of the heavenly. And only God knows what that is. You know, aren't you getting kind of homesick for heaven? My, I think every believer from, from young on should just begin. And you know what? We had to drop a station a while back, and we had kids call, 11, 12-year-old kids called and cried, literally bawled, that they were using our program every morning in their homeschooling. And why in the world we had to drop the program? Well, I'll tell you, that tears you up. But on the other hand, it thrills us to death that we do have a lot of kids listening to our program. A couple of years ago, Iris and I were just beside ourselves. A mother and two kids came to one of our seminars, and they came up. One was 14, one was 12, one then honey, something like that. And they hugged us like long-lost grandparents. And the poor mother was so embarrassed. And <laughs> she said, well, Les, you've got to remember they watch you every morning. Well, you know, that thrills our hearts that we're not just appealing to the gray hairs. We do have a large audience of kids, 8, 9, 10. In fact, we've got one family now. Their kids are 17 and 18, and they've been with us almost for seven or eight years every morning. So you keep praying that we'll keep reaching a lot of these younger folks. But anyway, 
Most of you understand that the tabernacle in the wilderness was made of earthly materials, but this tabernacle, this prototype, if I may call it that, is made in the glory with things that we can't comprehend. We just don't know. All I know is it's glorious. It's going to be beyond human comprehension. All right, so verse 11, finishing it. So this tabernacle in the heavenlies is not made with hands. That is to say, it's not of this building, or if you have a margin, this creation. So it's not on this earth. All right, now verse 12. Here comes the whole meat or the substance of this portion of Scripture. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, as we just saw in the previous verses in our last program, not with the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, the blood of the cross on Calvary, and by His own blood, as the high priest entered behind the veil with the blood of an animal, this high priest, Christ Jesus Himself, enters into the Holy of Holies in heaven, in other words, into the presence of God the Father, not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with His own blood, the price of redemption. Now, I know this is all hard for us humans to comprehend, but we take it by faith. How did He approach the Father in the Holy of Holies in heaven, presenting His own blood at the mercy seat of the throne room, even as Aaron and the following priests came in behind the veil with the blood of animals, so Christ came in with His own blood? blood. Now, I'm going to take you back to John's Gospel. We haven't done this either for a long time. We did it when we were in, I think, John's Gospel, verse by verse. But now come back with me to chapter 20 of John's Gospel, and you all know the account, <coughs> how that Mary Magdalene, along with all of the other believers and followers of Jesus, had no idea that He would be raised from the dead. Never entered their mind, even though Jesus had told the twelve more than once that He would, yet was hid from them, providentially, of course. And so Mary Magdalene is no different. And so she's going to carry out the process of anointing the body after the burial. All right, so verse 1 of chapter 20, the first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early. In other words, before full daylight. And it was yet dark. And she comes to the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now, here comes the human element. The minute she sees that, she shook to her toes. And what does she do? She just turns on her heels and she runs as fast as that poor girl could run and finds Peter and John. Verse 9, 2, She ran and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, whom we know was John. And she said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. And we know not where they have laid him. Now Peter doesn't say, Well, Mary... We know he's not supposed to be in the tomb. He's raised from the dead, does he? No, he hasn't got the foggiest notion of resurrection yet. And so he's just as shocked as Mary. And so Peter therefore went forth and John and came to the sepulcher. Now don't think for a minute that was an early morning stroll. They ran. This was shocking. The tomb empty? With all those Roman guards stationed with threat of their life if anybody would try to take the corpse? Because, you know, that's what the Pharisees did. They made sure that the Romans stationed guards around the tomb because they had heard that somebody had said he would be raised after three days and three nights, so they thought that was just a gimmick. They'd come and steal the corpse, and then they'd be able to say, see, he rose from the dead. So they 
purposely asked the Romans to put extra guards around the tomb. Now, if you know Roman law, you know that when those men were stationed with that kind of responsibility, it was with their life at stake. And here comes Mary, and now Peter and John, and I don't even see any record that the soldiers are around. They've either run for their life, or they're already executed, or whatever, but they're not there. But the tomb is empty, see? So verse 4, Peter and John run together, and the other disciple outran Peter. And again, I think this is all so practical, because we're pretty confident that Peter was quite a bit older than John. And so the young man shows his athletic ability, and so John outruns Peter. And he came first to the sepulcher. <clears throat> but of course, John is more timid than Peter, and so he doesn't jump in. Now, you want to remember, the sepulcher was a cave in the limestone, and that's why the stone could be rolled away from the opening. And so John, stooping down, looked in, saw, verse 5 now, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. I, I just picture him as being a little bit young and timid. Verse 6, here comes Peter. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him. Now, I like to bring this down to the every day. He's probably around 40 years old. And I don't know how far he's run, but he's been running pretty hard. So what's he doing? He's huffing and he's puffing. Can't you just hear him? He's huffing and puffing, but he doesn't even stop to get his breath. He just goes right into that cave-type sepulcher and saw the linen clothes lie. Verse 7, as he looks around, he, he just surveys the whole scenario. And then he sees the napkin. That was about Jesus' head. And it wasn't lying with the linen clothes, but was wrapped together. In other words, meticulously folded in a place by itself. In other words, this wasn't just some ramshackle casting off of these grave clothes. Verse 8, Then went in also that other disciple, John, who came first to the sepulcher. Now watch this. And he saw the evidence, and he what? He believed. Now, what does that tell you? He didn't know anything of resurrection before this. He knew who Jesus was. He was a believer, but he had no concept of it. Now, again, that just tells us something. You see, to believe in the resurrection was not a prerequisite for salvation in the kingdom gospel. All they were to believe was that Jesus of Nazareth was who he said he was, and that he was the King of Israel, the promised Messiah. That's all. They didn't have to believe in a death, burial, and resurrection. So it wasn't necessary for Peter and John to have believed in resurrection up to this point because it wasn't expected of them. God kept it secret from them. But now when they see the evidence, they believed. Now look at the next verse. Verse 9, For as yet... They, Peter and John, and I guess I can safely include Mary Magdalene, for as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Plain English. They didn't know. But they didn't have to know to be saved in that kingdom economy. Verse 10, So then the disciples went away to their own home. Verse 11, now we pick up Mary again, Mary Magdalene. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. I suppose her curiosity got the best of her. What in the world caused Peter and John to exit so quickly and, and go? And so she looks in. Verse 12, now she sees something that Peter and John did not. And what is that? Angels. Now she sees two angels in white, one at the head of where the body would have lain and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had, past tense, lain. Now these angels said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, 
and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, knew not that it was Jesus. And now Jesus speaks and he says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, Mary, supposing him to be the gardener. Now, I have to stop. Why, first and foremost, does not Mary recognize the resurrected Christ? Well, I have to feel the number one reason is, if you'll come back with me to Isaiah, come back with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 52, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 52, verses 13 and 14. Now remember what my question was. Why do you suppose Mary did not recognize Jesus as he's now standing there in human form, bodily? And in the next verse it says she thought he was the gardener, so he didn't have kooky looks about him. He looked very normal. But this is what she saw last before they took Christ down from the cross. Isaiah 52, verses 13 and 14. Behold, <clears throat> my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So we know the prophet is speaking of the Messiah. Verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any man. Now listen, we know that the human being were experts at torture all the way up through human history. They've been able to torture men beyond human comprehension. But nobody under the most extreme torture, ever had their facial appearance so distorted and so marred as Christ was on the cross. Now, we have to realize that, yes, he was scourged. He took the beatings that the Romans administered before he went to the cross. But other than that, and they pulled his beard and the crown of thorns, but other than that, we have nothing in the record that they beat on his face. So we have to kind of put two and two together. What caused his visage to make him look so horrible that he was worse than any human being had ever appeared? The sins of mankind. All the sin of the world was laid on Christ as he hung on that cross. And you and I, again, in the human realm, cannot comprehend that. But I can see that this would cause that physical deforming of his very appearance. And so more marred than any man, and his form more marred than the sons of men. Not because so much what the Romans had done, but because of the sin that was laid on him as he hung there on the cross. All right, so now if you'll come back to John, use just a little bit of human logic. So if the first thing that Mary would have thought of Christ coming back to life, she would have had to undertake seeing that marred face and all that went with it. But here stands someone looking perfectly whole. Not a scar, not a mark, except in his hands and his feet and his side. All right? So she, verse 15 again, supposing him to be the gardener, which means he looked perfectly normal, not like anything bizarre at all. And she said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, or if you have taken him away, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away, and I will give him the proper burial and all the ceremonial, uh, the ritual of the spices and herbs and so forth. 
Now Jesus speaks in verse 16. And he said unto her, Mary. Now Iris and I are learning that when we're in strange places, people recognize our voice far before they'll recognize our facial appearance. And you just watch for it. You just watch. I've given this example before. You can be in the kitchen, and if your television is in the den or in the living room, completely out of sight. And if you hear a movie with someone that was maybe a great star 30, 40 years ago, you'll recognize the voice long before you will the picture. I know I do. I can recognize a voice just immediately. Well, I think it's typical of everybody. Well, same way here. She didn't recognize anything about him from his physical appearance, but the minute he spoke, it was voice recognition. And that's all she had, he had to say, Mary, see? And so she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, or that is to say, Master, can't you just hear the excitement in that? These people are human, just as human as we are. And to suddenly realize that this was Jesus standing there in front of her, alive and normal looking, no wonder she was shook. And now look what she does. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not. Now, again, you've got to read between the lines once in a while, and you won't do any violence to Scripture by doing this. What was the custom, even back then, when you saw somebody that you hadn't seen in a while, or you were just suddenly engrossed in who they are? Well, you hug them. You all do. My, I, I see a lot of people. I've always said I'm not a born hugger, but I see some of the rest of you. My, you can hug. Well, listen, they were no different. So what's she ready to do? She's ready to give him a bear hug, to think that he's alive and well and normal. But what does Jesus do? He stops her short, see? And he says, touch me not. Mary, don't you hug me. Why? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. But, now he's not talking about Acts chapter 1. He's talking about an immediate ascension right here. So he says, go to my brethren, that would be the, the 11, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. He had spoken these things. Now verse 19, so that's what I'm saying. We're not talking about the ascension in Acts chapter 1. We're talking about an ascension right here and now on that resurrection morning. Because then the same day at evening, that's Sunday night, being the first day of the week, and the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, there came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now, where was he those eight or ten hours? In glory, plain as day. All right, now let's come back to Hebrews once again, and maybe this will all fall in place. Back to Hebrews. Chapter 9. Verse 11 and 12 again. But Christ... Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, now resurrected, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. In other words, this glorious tabernacle in the heavenlies. Now verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, not once a year, but once for all eternity into the holy place that is in heaven now, the one behind the veil as it was on earth. But he entered into the holy of holies in the heavenlies into the very presence of the merciful, gracious God, not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own blood. Now, do I have to explain? What does he do? When he leaves off speaking with Mary, taking a sampling of his blood that was shed on the cross, I feel he literally took his own blood. 
And being the God that he was, there was no problem for him to recapture some of that blood that had fallen. And he takes that blood and he takes it right up into the throne room of heaven and presents it as the full atoning blood now of the cross, which was far above the animal's blood. It was the blood offering that all humanity had now been waiting 4,000 years from Adam. And now it finally happens. And now he has totally removed the veil. And we no longer have to go through all of this ritual. Now every believer has full access without apology into that throne room of heaven. Why? Because the divine blood of Christ has now been placed on that mercy seat forever and ever and ever. All right, in a couple minutes we have left, let's go to verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats or the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean if it could sanctify to the purifying of the flesh in that old economy, how much more? Oh, beyond comparison. You cannot compare the efficacy of animal's blood with this divine blood of Christ. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself as the supreme sacrifice. See how plain this is? He is the atoning blood. He is the supreme sacrifice. And so he offered himself without spot to God. Then how much more can't that purge your conscience from dead works to now serve who? the living God. Oh, what a difference. We're not worshiping idols of wood and stone. We're not worshiping some man-made religion. When we come in under that shed blood of Christ by faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, we now have full access to God. We can pray to him 24 hours a day, and we can slip out with full assurance that we're going into His presence. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.